Yes, a few weeks ago at Eden Park, Martin Crowe was officially inducted into the ICC Cricket Hall of Fame. He became the 79th player to receive this accolade for services to cricket. He is the third New Zealander to be acknowledged in this way. Our second inductee, Debbie Hockley, has asked me to send her apologies due to another commitment. She dearly wanted to be here this evening to share this tribute with Martin. She offers her best wishes to you, Martin. I am extremely privileged to be asked to celebrate Martin's induction. Hogan, as he's better known, was a superb classical batsman. He was an innovative captain, a commentator, an author, a columnist, and he's a mentor for one or two of the black cap players. The word great is often overused and sometimes misused. There are some good players, there are some very good players. Greatness is bestowed on a few cricketers who have graced this wonderful game. Great players have a rare and special quality. They triumph under pressure and adversity. They help win games. They develop a record that is the envy of many. They are remembered for how they play the game and what they have achieved over a long period of time. I know that you'll hate me mentioning statistics in an address, but for the record, Hogan played 77 test matches. He scored a record 1700s and 1850s. He averaged nearly 46. He had a career best 299, a New Zealand record at the time. He took 14 test wickets. I don't know how. <laughs> and I'm sorry, Martin, that's not good enough to be classed as an all-rounder in the game. Hogan had a cricket affair with the Basin Reserve. He scored 500s. His highest score of 299 was against Sri Lanka in 1981. How he got out to Arjuna Ranatunga is a mystery to me on 299. He also featured in a world record partnership of 467 with Andrew Jones. In first class cricket, he scored 20,000 runs. 71 hundreds, averaging 56. Quite an outstanding record. Throw in another 4,704 one-day runs at 38. Tells you that he was a master batsman. Statistics only tell half the story. But what about the man? He showed great courage and skill when batting against the West Indies pace attack of Marshall, Garner, Holding and Walsh all great fast bowlers and the most fearsome bowlers of that time. He scored 300s against the West Indies. I had the pleasure of watching what I believe to be his te best test innings. New Zealand playing Australia at the Gabba, 1985. Australia bowled out for 179. We replied with 533. We had a lead of 354. Martin Crowe's career best at the time of 188 was a major contributor in getting that lead and that allowed us to win by an innings and 44 runs, our first ever test win on Australian soil. In fact, we went on to win that series 2-1. The quality of his batting was based around how he played the ball. When he got into trouble, he had the time to bail out of that shot and adapt to play another shot. This was very, very special to watch. It is true to say that I never got him out in a first-class match. However, he played and missed at more balls than I can remember <laughs> during my career. Hogan keeps reminding me of that. It may well be his finest achievement in keeping me out. <laughs> but our real contests were in the nets prior to a test or a one-day international, and I tested and I challenged him. Hogan has often said that that was the best practice and preparation that he could have before big games. Well, Hogan, if I was able to help you in a small way to achieve what you did in the game of cricket, it is a great compliment, and I thank you for that. I still can't work out how Arjuna Ranatunga got you out when I couldn't. <laughs> One of those things. Hogan... You may recall in 1985 when New Zealand played Pakistan at home, 
You were aware that I had a motivational mantra chart in the lid of my cricket coffin. And one day you used my nickname Paddles as your mantra and pinned it to the wall of the dressing room at Lancaster Park to get you focused with key words. Just a little reminder of that. Pride of performance, aims and application, desire to do well, dedication to the job, be one of the lads, enjoy the game, success and winning. And he went on to score 84 in that match. Obviously that paddles mantra was not of a great satisfaction to you because in the next ma uh, match at Carisbrook, you had another mantra with the letters uh, of Hogan uh, pinned on the wall. Hundreds, organisation and be prepared. Guts, aims, play your natural game. He went on to score 84 and 57. And during that series, you contributed significantly to our first ever Test Series win against Pakistan and New Zealand. I think those mantras summed up how Martin Crowe played the game of cricket. Tonight, we honour you. I am proud to call you a friend. You were a great player, simply one of our best ever. On behalf of us all here tonight, New Zealand cricket, world cricket, friends, family and fans, thank you for your magnificent contribution to this great game known as cricket. Martin, can you come to the stage, please? January 23rd, 1984. The day Martin Crowe scored his first Test match century. It was to be the first of many, 17 to be precise. It wasn't just the Test arena where Crowe showcased his ability to score runs with style and elegance. His unforgettable performances with the bat and innovative captaincy will be forever synonymous with the 92 World Cup. I mean, this is unbelievable. These are, of course, just a handful of highlights from a truly remarkable career. Yes, it's on to the crowd, and they're on to the crowd, oh no! Inducted into the ICC Hall of Fame last month, Martin Crowe rightly takes his place among world cricket's elite. Marty. Um, I'll take you back first of all on the back of what Sir Richard has just said to Smallbone Park and Rotorua in my first class game where I nicked you out. Does that make me a better bowler than him? Well, it was a beautiful, fast delivery around middle and leg stump, bounced, went away, took the glove. I couldn't believe the, the umpire actually detected a, a touch. I sort of looked back at you and I had a little technique in those days where if I nicked it and I just kept looking at the bowler um, and not look behind and give it away... I was hopeful that the umpire might not have seen it, mm. but on that occasion he definitely saw it and I was out to a, a better cricketer on the day. Well, well. <laughs> I was a little embarrassed, I've got to say. Um, Marty, uh, let's go back to the start, the, the very the early days, I suppose, growing up and, and um, your, your idols, your, uh, you know, what, your influences in cricket. Well, uh, my dad, um, who was in, in love with the game of cricket, he, um, he took me along to Eden Park in 1968 uh, my first big match and the West Indies were touring and I had um, I'd seen a photo of Gary Sobers uh, in the Wisdoms that were scattered around the house mm -hmm. and so I was very excited uh, Dad took us along because Eden Park's so different now um, the picket fence and, mm -hmm. um, and so I, I saw this West Indian team I fell in love with the West Indians I thought they were born to play cricket I thought cricket was designed for them and watch Wes Hall play his last test match um, and Gary Sobers. He didn't get a lot of runs, but I was just captivated by the way they moved in the field and the way they played and their joy for the game. New Zealand did very well against them. Uh, Bruce Taylor got 100, and it was just... Uh, I fell in love with the, the game of cricket at that point. Um, and then it was a case of really Dad taking Jeff and off us off to Cornwall Park every Saturday to, uh, to live our dream. He still watches from there, eh? 
up on the hill. Dad, uh, Dad was there at Eden Park on uh, February 28. Um, he always sat up on the what was the old North Stand, the ASB Stand now, and he had a wine sack. Um, <laughs> and uh, he, he took that along for 40 years. He wouldn't uh, get it in nowadays. Uh, he wouldn't get it in no, nowadays. I no, wouldn't be allowed. Well, m- maybe he might have talked his way in <laughs> with it, but um, I, I'm slightly digressing, I guess, but I, I think the greatest feeling for me on, on that beautiful day at Eden Park when we, we downed that ungracious team um, through a Trent and Kane special and 40,000 people and... Mm. Um, to go out and, and uh, receive the, the Hall of Fame cap uh, it was for mum and dad yeah. um, because for 40 years they had sat in that, in that park um, and uh, mum said to me later that it was the proudest cricketing moment of her life yeah. and, uh, and I think dad was toasting her sentiments as well I'm so that sure gave me a huge buzz and the whole family were there, Lorraine and Emma and it was a terrific day yeah. When you fell in love with the West Indies at Eden Park while watching them did you get any of that love back when you were playing against them? <laughs> you know what? I, I did. Um, and I, I know what you mean. Uh, there were times when um, your life sort of flashed before you. And, you know, it's amazing when you think of the tragedy of Phil Hughes, how many times we were in that same situation and were lucky. Um, but the Western Ends were real pros. And um, I, I never, I, I can't remember one nasty word said from them. Um, there was the odd one from Viv at first slip. Um, but then again, I had just taken his place at Somerset. He'd just been sacked. <laughs> so I understood that. A little bit, uh, little bit angry. But Joel had also been sacked, and, mm. and yet the, I actually adored them. I, I thought they played the game in, the, in a beautiful spirit. They were ruthless with the ball. Um, they had a, um, a strategy which was unbeatable. Uh, and so when you played them, you just felt that... Uh, it was a privilege because you're up against the greatest and it brought the best out in you and um, you knew you weren't going to succeed often but when you did it was special and uh, uh, the New Zealand team pulled off some good performances and I'll never forget that win in 1987 when Paddles refused to bowl and um, (laughs) he must have thought he was bowling to me. Anyway, he came back, got six for, uh, after Charlie Chatfield had knocked off the first four but we beat the West Indies, Mm. the best team possibly ever uh, at Lancaster Park uh, in 87 and um, uh, Jeff and I put on 150 uh, our best ever partnership so there was um, uh, you know there were great memories you know I could go on yeah. but that was, uh, that was that was very special Paddles mentioned Brisbane I think Lancaster Park um, holds a pretty special place in his and my heart too Those times at Somerset uh, not a lot of our guys, a few now, get the opportunity to play county cricket. How good were they for you at that time? Because three overseas players, you were up against the best in the world on a regular basis. Um, I was very lucky as a young man to be uh, able to play county cricket as I did. Um, and it, it came down to one man, Ian Botham. Um, played against New Zealand obviously a lot and he saw in me something, apparently. Um, I had an average of 15 and about 13 tests. Um, I wasn't a very good bowler, uh, as Paddles has alluded to, even though I opened the bowling with him in four test matches. <laughs> no, 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 actually it was only one at the SCG. That, that's right, he didn't turn up to Pakistan. I had to bowl <laughs> instead of him um, in 1984. You see what you've got to do sometimes. Yeah, I know. Uh, and so, <laughs> you know, county cricket was huge. Um, uh, and Ian Botham saw something um, in me and he gave me a chance. I was 20 years old. Um, and I was 20 going on 12, really, from a maturity point of view. So to, to go and live with him was just not going to happen. Uh, and I walked out after uh, six weeks, and Vic Marks saw me at the MCG the other day, and he still remembers the look on Ian Botham's face when I told him that I, I was out and I was moving on, and Ian Botham had never had anyone tell him that. Mm. So I felt good about that. But he, no, he was instrumental um, in... And giving me a chance, you know, it's a, it, uh, and our guys have experienced that in the last few years. It just fine tunes your game. It's great to go back from international cricket to, to domestic cricket, whether it be here in New Zealand or county cricket, and just just get in touch with your game and get in touch with yourself uh, before you go back into the cauldron of international cricket. Uh, I, I could sit here for an hour and talk to you, Marty. I know we, we don't, unfortunately don't have that long. Your thoughts on the recent times and the World Cup and, and, and what this side has been through? <clears throat> You know, I'll reel off a couple of dates just to uh, 
help cooking this up. February 14, um, it's, it's a special day because it's the day I married the, um, the greatest friend of my life, uh, Lorraine, uh, our wedding anniversary. And, um, and that's, of course, when the World Cup started and, mm -hmm. at Hagley Oval. Uh, what a great story um, around Christchurch, getting ready for that World Cup. And um, I, was I was nervous and excited because of Marty Guptill uh, opening the batting with, with Brendan. There was a personal thing there and there was a collective thing there as a, as a New Zealander. Um, and I'll never forget the over. Guppy got off the mark. He took strike every time. I sometimes wish he hadn't. But he, and leading up to that series, uh, he took the strike and he, he had some troubles. But he took the strike that day and he got off the mark. And it was a bit like, you know, Brendan said, you know, mate, great start. But just sit back and watch because I've got something I want to say. <laughs> And he went bang, bang, first two fours through the cover field for mm. four. And that opening five minutes of that World Cup was a statement to the world, uh, but in particular to his teammates, that they were ready. And I got up out of my chair and I just went, they're ready, they're here. Um, and we were in the moment. And uh, they, they put on 100 together, those two. And I, I just, I don't know, yeah. you were there. Yeah, but I special. felt that was the perfect way to... Mm to say uh, the World Cup's yeah. in town and, uh, you know, and, and I, I truly believed at that point that we could go all the way. And the next date? Another okay, one the, and about. the next date. I think you've got four, haven't you? Well, February 28 we've touched on. Um, and I guess, the, you know, two weeks later, three weeks later, March 21, um, at, uh, at the Caketon. And just a quick little story about uh, Gup. I text him. I, I text him just three letters. O M G. Um, I just kept saying it all day long, mm. and in the end, it was Oh my gut. Um, and in fact, whenever I think of that Oh my God, sort of saying, I just keep Oh my gut. Yeah. Um, if you say it quick enough, it sounds like Oh my God. <laughs> and I just uh, watched that first ball, you know, and, and it took me back to the to the year when ago the, the year ago when he came. Uh, two men, he said, um, Hogan, will you give me some help? And I said, and I looked at him, I said, what do you want? And he said, I want to be a, a successful test player. No mention of the World Cup or one day cricket. And I said, uh, for you, I'll do anything. Mm -hmm. Because he just looked as though he was ready to, uh, to change his life. And I think he'd made a, a wonderful uh, choice in Laura and the McGoldricks, who I think are the most wonderful family I've ever met. The love that he now has around them gave him the ability to open up his heart and ask for more help. And, um, and we stripped his game back, and, uh, and to see that first shot against the West Indies go for four to a very good outswinger that was swinging late and full, zeroing in on middle and off, and he hit it back past him for four. And I just thought that was, the, that was a combination of a year of sacrifice and courage. Um, and, you know, as any coach would say, that, that, that's why you want to help. Um, you want to see someone fulfil their potential and of course the, ne the rest of the day was a blur and a, and a dream like uh, to score 237 um, in one day. Um, so I want to thank you Gup for, um, for lighting up my life in that, in that moment but I just want to say well done on the year. So, f so March 21 um, which led to March 24 which led to March 29 off, off the back of the greatest match I think we've ever seen in this country, that semi-final at Eden Park, South Africa. Uh, and I, I think the moment that I'll never forget is, is Grant reaching down to, to reach out to Dale Steyn um, and, and, and that gentle gladiator kind of look, not the hairy javelin that he's known for. <laughs> he just epitomised the New Zealand spirit. And we may not have won the cup, but you know what? We won at the higher level, which was the spirit, um, which was the method, which was uh, the love that um, I've never experienced this in my life, walking tonight into night. I've never experienced this family love, um, this cricket community coming together. So well done to New Zealand cricket, Whitey and the board, uh, the Baz. Uh, the last two years, there, there, there was some pain two years ago, but you need pain to, to learn, and, and um, I just... Last year, I looked at New Zealand cricket with different eyes because of my own journey, and I thought, you know, um, they deserve everything be because they have responded to a hard situation, and they've grown, and they've matured, 
um, just as we all must as human beings. So um, congratulations to everyone in this room because it's not just the last six weeks. I thought it was really two years of incredible work, uh, a really hard work, a lot of pain, a lot of tears, um, and everyone uh, can feel very proud about um, where we're at because it's, it's laid a foundation for the young kids uh, for generations to come. Um, and I, I don't think I can say that uh, about any other era. This is an era that um, has made me incredibly happy to have played the game. Well, Marty, can I just say, um, whatever the future may bring, I think cricket, New Zealand cricket, world cricket, is a far better place for having you played the game. Uh, you inspired a generation of people when I played. Um, you were, you know, I captained me. Sorry, but it's a bit emotional. Um, and, Actually, and I, well, let, let's tell the story if we've got time, because yeah. <laughs> we, we, picked Sto we picked Simon, you know, a rough, <laughs> a rough diamond uh, for Zimbabwe and Sri Lanka in 1992. And in the, first, um, bowling, in the first net session, I'm a bit tired from jet lag, and on the first ball he bowled at me, he just whizzed it past my, uh, my left <laughs> temple. And I just said, what's going on? Just wanted to make notice of uh, selection for the first test. We picked him, he got a wicket, he bowled beautifully, he did get an injury, but um, you were always an asset uh, and you went on to take 98 wickets and I, and I know what that feels like to fall just a couple short. So um, <laughs> I, thank you for your, I thank you for your emotion, it means a lot. Um, to have you in the commentary box, you've always, um, you know, you've always seen uh, cricket in a positive way and even though you gave Guppy a hard time in October, I kept saying to you, I, like, I, kept, I, like I kept, to think it's, it's I kept saying to you, February 14, <laughs> February 14, and February 14 was the start. And uh, six weeks later, we're here, and we're just, we're just loving Enjoy it. it. I can just see it, I can feel it, um, and I wish it wouldn't end. But uh, you know, it'll inspire the next mm. crowd. And before um, you send me on my way, I just want to um, say that on March the 29th, uh, it was an incredible day at the MCG. I was very exhausted, but. Um, I stood on the end of the boundary and I watched the presentation in Australia lift the cup and then I noticed uh, the, the boys starting to walk in my direction. I didn't realise that the dressing room was right where I was. Uh, and I saw Dan Vittori. I think he's somewhere here. And, uh, and I, just, I just burst open with all the emotion that I, um, that I had and uh, he gave me a, a huge hug and I just said, what a career, what, a, what an inspiration. You set the benchmark for everyone in this team. 18 years of class, of skill, um, devotion. Um, oh, you know, I, I, that was the moment for me, March 29 was, was Dan limping off for the last time. Um, and uh, I, I've got your seat warm, Dan, in the, in the hall. Uh, right next to me, buddy. Um, you're going to have to shave, though, I'm afraid. <laughs> uh, they only allow moustaches, a paddles. Uh, and only the Dr. W.G. Grace is allowed to wear the full nasty. Um, <laughs> but I just want to know, Dan, that you're, um, you're going to be sitting next to me, buddy, and, and I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to that moment. Yeah, Marty, congratulations on the Hall of Fame. Uh, congratulations on everything you've done. <laughs> as far as Ladies and gentlemen, what a mate.